All right. So, you know, we obviously, the tricuspid valve tends to be the forgotten valve a lot, but there's a lot that's going on in this space, and it's really exciting. And just like anything else, we're just starting to learn more about how to manage tricuspid regurgitation, especially from a structural heart standpoint. Um, again, like everything else in the structural space, we have to relearn all of our anatomy again and really drive it home because as we know in the structural space, anatomy is critically important to understanding how to um, intervene on valve dysfunction. I do have a couple of conflicts of interest. I do uh, some anatomic work with both of the valve companies. You know, on the spectrum of heart valve intervention, and this was, this, this shows mitral intervention, but it goes with tricuspid. We are becoming more and more per percutaneous, and as we become more percutaneous in our approach, the image guidance becomes even more and more critical. Our planning becomes more critical, and our knowledge of anatomy becomes more critical to our ability to achieve successful outcomes, which is one of the reasons why I think I've been asked to give this lecture. Just to quickly put us all back in the same spot, if you make a fist with your, with your left hand and have your right hand wrap around it like a glove, that's kind of how, that's how the right ventricle interacts with the left. And in fact, when we look at a heart, we look at the right ventricle wrapping around. If I were to take the right ventricle off, the left ventricle underneath would be a mirror image. And I think that's an important thing to keep in, in our thoughts when we're, in, when we're working, into the, working in the right ventricle is exactly the shape and the function of the right ventricle. The other thing from a purely image guidance standpoint is that the esophagus is far away. Um, the tricuspid valve may be difficult to image, especially in patients with aortic stenosis. Uh, the TE may not be as um, useful as it is in, the, say, the mitral position because we have to image through here. We may get shadowing or other things. And compared to the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve has much thinner leaflets. They don't show up as well, easier to tear. And so for those reasons, T still is one of the primary drivers, but we may also be incorporating things such as, for, from a guidance standpoint, transthoracic and ice. We also may, and then we also consider other imaging modalities to help us in diagnosing mechanism severity of TR. Just to quickly put things in perspective, uh, we have three leaflets, typically, Unlike this, what this netogram has, the anterior leaflet is typically the largest. I always point out a couple, I always like having anatomic markers that guide me when I'm looking at imaging. And the anatomic markers for me in the tricuspid valve are the septal and anterior leaflet commissure always points toward the aortic valve, and specifically the commissure of the non and right coronary cusp, because sitting under here is the membranous septum, the AV node, the bundle of His, and having, knowing this interaction helps you tremendously, especially when we have to switch from 3D to two-dimensional imaging and guiding where we are looking, what we are looking for. So I'm gonna point that out. The other thing I'm gonna point out, point out and come back to is the course of the, cor of the right coronary artery, and that becomes critically a point, important, especially when we start working with my tricuspid annular procedures. We're looking in the right ventricle. First, the right ventricle doesn't make up the true apex of the heart. That's important. The other important piece is that the anterior papillary muscle is the most prominent and consistent papillary muscle with, a, with what we call a moderator band, which connects the, the anterior papillary muscle to the septum. Important pieces of information. If you look at this dissection, there again, it points, I point out a couple of things. The star, and these are, I've, I've uh, modified my slides a little bit. The new uploads, the new upload of my slides is gonna be up before the end of the meeting. Um, this is the commissure of the non and the right. If you follow it down, here's the septal and anterior leaflet pointing toward that commissure of the septal and anterior leaflet. Here's your right atrial appendage, which is anterior, which is, which is typically associated with the anterior leaflet. You can nicely see this right coronary, and here is the right coronary in close association with the anus, but especially back here posteriorly. That right coronary can be very close to that posterior annulus of the tricuspid valve. Here's my coronary sinus. Again, another one of those key pieces, coronary sinus, posterior septal leaflet commissure, all right? So when I see coronary sinus, I know what I'm looking at in my annulus. I know what I'm looking at from a leaflet standpoint. This star just represents the right or posterior medial trigone. Um, you don't, the, the, the septal attachment of the leaflet tends to be, of the septal leaflet tends to be very stable. As you can see, it's along the ventricular septum where the anterior and posterior leaflets and that associated annulus is what dilates out over time. As I mentioned, the tricuspid valve is much thinner. 
Uh, it has, um, it's easier to tear. This coaptation line between the septal and anterior leaflet tends to be the longest. Uh, in my experience, it's one of the ones when we put clips on that we put clips on the most consistently. And just like in the mitral valve, I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep this up. For instance, in this commissure, you can see that the chordae tend to increase in number and density as you move toward the commissures in any of these leaflets. So lots of space to maneuver in the middle, but much more, much more dense chordae at the commissures, which also can be an important marker, again, for getting, having trouble, when we're, for example, with clip placement. This was a very nice article that kind of showed that intervention on the mitral side, the coronary, the circumflex artery is close to the mitral annulus, typically on the lateral portion of the annulus where the, P, where the P1 leaflet attaches. In the, in the tricuspid valve, it's two points. There's a point that is more anterior along the anterior leaflet and another point more posterior along the posterior leaflet attachment where that interaction between the right coronary and tricuspid annulus tends to be the closest. And a lot of it has to do with the dominance of the artery. A, a dominant right coronary artery will have, typically has closer uh, association with the annulus than say a non-dominant. This is a nice three-dimensional uh, showing kind of the anat nicely shows that anatomy in motion. Here's that largest anterior leaflet, the septal leaflet attachment, this is from the ventricular view, and the posterior leaflet, which can be, in, my, in, in most of my pieces, the posterior leaflet and the septal leaflet, which one's bigger tends to be variable. And you can see here, this is um, a pacing wire coming through in that posterior commissure, which is another thing that we have to take into consideration when we're working on the right side, because obviously it's much more common um, in, the, in, uh, in right ventricular and uh, tricuspid intervention. Just so you can see from a gross anatomic standpoint, septal leaflet, anterior leaflet, moderator band. Again, when you're looking, when you're working around this anterior septal leaflet commissure up in here, again, cord density increases. Don't forget, you also have a moderator band underneath that may, that may have variable size that you have to deal with. So all these things come into play. The final piece I want to mention from an anatomic standpoint is here's the coronary sinus. Remember coronary sinus, again, think septal posterior leaflet commissure. The coronary sinus, septal leaflet attachment, and what we call the, the um, tendon of Todoro represent the triangle of Koch. The final thing that we always have to keep in mind is where that AV node is. And at the apex of that triangle is where the AV node sits and also where the bundle of Hiss is. A lot of our tricuspid interventions work, again, at that septal anterior leaflet coaptation line and up near that commissure. It would be very, it's very easy to bump this in that intervention, which then can lead to um, complete heart block. And here it is, coronary sinus, septal leaflet attachment, AV node um, sitting in that area up in that region. All right, so just to conclude, to put a little bit of anatomy to, the, to this talk, um, there would be an imaging talk coming up, but I think it's important then to put everything together. Here is your septal leaflet, anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, aortic valve up here. This is the orientation I typically use when I'm talking about anatomy of the aortic valve. I put the aortic valve on top. What's opposite the aortic valve is the posterior leaflet, and then you have the septal leaflet, and anterior leaflet. So aortic valve, posterior, septal, anterior leaflet. Remember coronary sinus, you can see very nicely the coronary sinus emptying with the septal posterior leaflet commissure sitting right there. Here's that commissure, the non and right coronary cusp with the septal leaflet and anterior leaflet commissure sitting right here. And if, we, if you think about this, this line I'm creating is typically our four chamber view. If I withdraw our probe, I'm moving up that commissure line toward the septal and uh, posterior leaflet, anterior leaflet commissure and along that coaptation line. If I advance the probe in a four chamber view, I move toward the posterior leaflet. That advancing and withdrawing the probe is a very powerful maneuver. If I change to what we call an inflow outflow view, again, when I look at my inflow outflow view and we'll see this, the aortic valve typically, whenever I see the aortic valve in my shot, I'm thinking this commissure and then opposite that will be the posterior leaflet. If we have what we call a modified bicaval view, typically you see the coronary sinus. Again, you know where you are in your anatomy. So using anatomy as your primary driver will help you in your interventions. This is, was a very nice summary of the anatomy that we, had, that, was, um, that we discussed. What are the things here, and this came from both of these articles listed below. 
Right atrium is thinner and more distensible. The thing I would, I would state is that we're not, we don't go through a septum for tricuspid procedures, so the um, device isn't anchored by the septum, which makes it easier to dive, and you have less coaxiality. Um, typically, one large, um, uh, again, the tricuspid annulus is much bigger with, and much more distensible. You have three leaflets. The leaflets are thinner and more fragile, which means it's easier for the leaflets to tear. Oops, sorry. Oop. And I missed my last slide, and I'm going to do it really fast. Um, actually, I can talk it through. Um, the other pieces are that, um, well, it's coming up. I don't think I can stop it anyways. <laughs> it's going to go fast. Um, the chordae, are, again, are thinner compared to the mitral side. Uh, they originate from various levels. You've got three papillary muscles with the anterior being the most dominant. Um, again, remember when you go to the commissures, the catheter entrapment becomes much more uh, possible. And then the right ventricle, again, is thinner, easier to perforate. You have the presence of the moderator band, which is going to sit under that anterior septal leaflet coaptation uh, point, uh, which then you can then interact with. Um, the pulmonic and tricuspid valve we showed are, are widely separated, so you don't have typically the risks of RVOT obstruction like you would on the left-sided. And again, that crescent-shaped cavity, put your right hand over your left like a glove, that's the shape of the right ventricle. Thank you very much. Um, again, I think we have time for questions because uh, I think we have a missing speaker. Um, so if anyone has questions, but I thought that was a phenomenal review, absolutely phenomenal. I think and important for us to think about um, when we're doing the interventions. Um, you didn't talk about the annulus per se. Um, wh what do you think about annulus and how robust uh, that tissue is? Um, well, the annulus is, is interesting compared. So challenges of the tricuspid annulus are, are multiple fold. One, it doesn't typically calcify like it does on the mitral side, so some of the interventions we do on the mitral side won't work on the tricuspid because the tricuspid annulus is very distensible. If you ever hold a, a heart and pull on the, where the anterior and posterior leaflets attach, it becomes very distensible, and in fact, that's the direction it typically dilates. In addition, remember the tricuspid annulus is much bigger than the mitral, so it's usually seven to nine centimeters squared. And you can imagine a patient with functional tricuspid regurgitation and a dilated annulus, it's bigger than nine centimeters. So that presents, presents additional challenges that we don't typically see on the mitral side. So you're not going to get anything to anchor into an annulus. You're not going, you know, from a, like a replacement standpoint, it's going to be much more challenging. Um, the other piece is because it dilates so much and you have three leaflets that you're dealing with, um, you could, your coaptation gaps can be quite large, which is another piece that's challenging that, we, that you'll see, I think, when we talk about clip therapy. A lot of times you can't grab, you can't put a clip on, on, the, on the largest gap because it's too wide for you to grasp. You typically have to go to one of those commissural areas and put a clip on there to make the gap smaller so you can put a second clip to solve the problem. So it presents a number of challenges that we, tip, that we see on the left, but the right presents additional things because of the anatomy and the way it presents. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, we'll move on. I think uh, Joelle's we, We're missing a speaker. So, yeah, sorry. So we're going to uh, go on to, uh, to the next one, and we'll speak about why we're talking about tricuspid through the whole session. Um, so anyway, Joel uh, Calvacante will speak on what you can learn from CT imaging for uh, procedures. Well, thank you, Becky. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to uh, present here for such a great meeting. I have learned tremendously over the last couple of days. And, uh, you know, the topic that was assigned to me is, you know, what can we learn from CT procedural planning? I'm going to delve into a little bit into CMR because it's also uh, very important for us to consider. And those are my disclosures, but a relevant one here is also that I'm quite excited to join our group here at Minneapolis Heart Institute, Paul, Richard, and many others here in the audience to start in October. So what are imaging needs for the tricuspid valve interventions? Uh, this is a great review paper that Beck, you also co-authored uh, along with uh, Joran Bax and uh, Jonathan Leipzig. 
highlighting that depending on the tricuspid valve intervention that is going to take place for this patient, we need to make some measurements, which makes sense, right? So if we're going to deal with heterotopic transcatheter valves, which will be a, you know, attaching to the cable, tri the, the cable to the right atrial junction, either in the SVC or in the IVC, we need to measure those distances. We need to measure what's the distance between the caval atrial junction and the first hepatic vein. It cannot be too short, otherwise it's going to obstruct that. As you heard from the prior speaker, if we're going to be doing tricuspid valve annuloplasty, we need to look at the dimensions of the tricuspid uh, annulus as well. We need to look at the distribution and the course of the right coronary artery. And the good news is that there are a lot of software nowadays available that allows us to do the segmentation and help us with that planning. Edge to edge plasty is something that we'll hear later about. Uh, I would argue that for the tricuspid valve, as you heard before, because it's the largest valve that we have in the heart, Actually, perhaps combination therapy it might be something that we will probably should discuss later on as a group. Where would this fit into this therapy? Spacer as well as an evolving ring as we have now new devices that are coming out in trials. So from the CT standpoint, the data acquisition would be similar to what we do for TAVR, with obviously the highlight that the contrast acquisition should be emphasizing, enhancing more on the right ventricle than obviously the left side. So we acquire throughout the cardiac cycle images of the entire chest, just exclude the legs. You know, there are protocols now described in the literature that are waved and EF based because you know, the slower the contrast and the RV dysfunction, the slower that contrast will be and we might have more time to image. For the tricuspid annual assessment, post-processing software, as I mentioned before, that would help us out in several of these aspects in addition to the fluoroscopic angles. So we cannot talk about tricuspid valve without talking about the right ventricle. And it's early in the morning, maybe you have or have not had your breakfast. But for the left ventricle, where it's very easy to image because it's a very circular donut, the croissant-shaped RV does not help us with the image by true dimension. As you can see, this is from actually the guidelines by the American Society of Guidelines. Depending on the probe angulation, I might have an RV that looks normal in size to an RV that might look borderline. And this inaccuracy and this capability of not being able to be precise and reproducible is something that we need to borrow into cross-sectional imaging modalities. Before we go into the CT, it's important that also we put important highlights on what are the best practices to image CT for the RV and tricuspid valve. This is an important paper that I would uh, leave with the reference to you that highlights the challenges that we have for imaging patients with tricuspid valve. One of the most common challenges is the fact that they have atrial fibrillation, very common. It's 80 plus percent or so. It's more common than uncommon. And so with atrial fibrillation and high heart rate, oops, we need to deal with CT scanners that not only will provide a very extensive coverage, the more number of detectors, the higher the ZX coverage, but you have to have also temporal resolution. And what is temporal resolution? Think about temporal resolution is the shorter speed. You have this fan blowing very fast. If I need to stop the motion and be able to see each one of the colors, I have to be click quite fast. For a heart rate around 70, temporal resolution should be ideally around 50 to 60 milliseconds. And the way to improve the temporal resolution, the best way is obviously to control the heart rate if you can. But if you can't, then use scanners, such as dual source CT scanners, that instead of having half of the rotation time, would be a quarter of the rotation time of the gantry. So there are developments in technology as well to help us out with that. Obviously, the CT scan requires a specific contrast injection protocols, as we mentioned. Ideally, we'd like to do a test bolus, so tracking the same order. But most of the protocols use what we call a triphasic contrast mix. A little bit more contrast than saline, a little bit less contrast than saline, and then a saline flush. And with that, we will be able to adequately opacify the right atrium and the right ventricle. This is just an example of a scan of a patient that for tricuspid valve intervention, as you can see, patients in atrial fibrillation, the scanner patients going fast fib, you do not see so well. It's blurred. And there is a lot of contrast mixing as well. This one actually was an appropriate gating, but the contrast actually was more on the left side, right on the right side. So importance to details makes a big difference. Ideally, what we would like to achieve is something like this, right? 
So we have a nice opacification of the right side, not so much on the left, but you can clearly see here the atrium is humongous in comparison to the right ventricle. There's incomplete coaptation of this valve. And sometimes we even see contrast refluxing all the way into the hepatic veins, which is another sign of significant tricuspid regurgitation, as you can see here. And with that, we can do the segmentation as well and calculate ejection fraction and so on and so forth. Now, what are the other anatomical uh, aspects that also are important? Tricuspid annulus, we do this with multiplanar reformats, four chamber, two chamber, then we can derive that. Mind you that we're going to be doing this in early, mid diastole, first frame after the valve opens. We can do then the tethering and tenting area. These are parameters that have been brought from transthoracic echocardiography literature, but completely applicable to the understanding of the dynamism of that tricuspid annulus, as well as this tethering and tenting area that might be actually a predictor of recurrence or lack of complete success. We can also measure the anatomical regurgitant orifice area throughout several phases of the systolic cardiac cycle, and we can do the averaging of that. With the CT, once we segment that annulus, we can also get the angles of implant. And um, with that, we can do prosthesis simulation, measure the cavo to right atrial uh, junction, as well as measure the course of the RCA and the distance to the tricuspid annulus, because we don't want it to obviously cause RCA injury in a distance less than two millimeters or so would be considered less favorable. Now, switching gears from CT to CMR, what's happening there? There is a lot happening for the right ventricle, and the right ventricle also can be, be beautifully imaged by CMR, actually without the need of any contrast. So for patients that are kind of borderline chronic kidney disease, I would argue that that's probably one of the best methods, because we can get images such as this one, as you can see. We can do a the four chamber, a two chamber, dedicated RV inflow and outflow view. We can look at the leaflets as well, do the same measurements. We can even do tri uh, three-dimensional segmentation of the annulus, similar to um, what we did with CT without the need of contrast. An evaluation also of a residual RV dysfunction and tricuspid regurgitation can be done in patients with uh, after mitral clip. As you can see, the challenge here, though, is that the atrial fibrillation. So we need to understand that this is also something, and we need to talk to industry, and we need to also be updated on what we have it available. Patients that have received the defibrillator, patients that have a pacemaker, yes, we can do that. There's going to be some artifact there, but that should not preclude us from doing the measurements. And importantly, quantification of tricuspid regurgitation is something that also CMR is capable of doing, despite the pacemaker. If we go the end diastolic and systolic volume, whatever the ventricle squeezed, which was 102 mLs, should have left the pulmonic valve. When we measure the flow into the main pulmonary artery, only 42. So if you do the math, 60 mLs actually is what regurgitated back into the right atrium. And that's the tricuspid regurgitant volume. If you divide that by 102, you have a tricuspid regurgitant fraction, significant for severe tricuspid regurgitation. Now technology, as I mentioned, continues to evolve. This is the standard way they require images for patients with CMR. Mind you, this patient is in heart failure. You can see bilateral pleural fusions, atrial fibrillation. One way that we can do, and it's available now, is do the free breathing in real time. So the patient is breathing in and out, and this is almost like an echo-like. The compromise is that we're going to decrease the temporal spatial resolution. But this is also another um, software development now that we can average a significant number of cardiac cycles, and by doing that, now we can measure precisely the ejection fraction with that. So we cannot talk about tricuspid interventions also without talking about the right ventricle, as mentioned before, and perhaps one of the most important parameters that we should track is actually RV function and RV dilation. Patients that have tricuspid regurgitation don't die from tricuspid regurgitation. They die from RV failure and from many other things as well. It's important to intervene prior to that. And the precision of CMR, actually, it's probably very advantageous. You know, in regards to, for example, to look at a change of only 5% on the EF, MRI will require 23 patients as opposed to 51 patients by a transthoracic echocardiography, so it could be cost savings. And lots of things happening to you. We can do RV strain. We can look at 4D flow tricuspid annulus. We can track that inflow, how much comes in, how much leaves, and even looking at fibrosis of the right ventricle, which might be another important marker that we can do. So in conclusion, CT planning for tricuspid interventions 
requires specific protocol for acquisition, requires specific protocol for segmentation of that annulus, is also capable of doing RV volume quantification, similar to what we have shown. And then for the CMR, lots of things happening. The good news is that most of them do not require gadolinium. And we should try to consider integrating, as we are doing now for these tricuspid interventions, in borrowing from the cross-sectional imaging, particularly at the combination of both modalities. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, we're moving on. Okay. Hopefully I can hear you. All right, um, I'm going to speak on um, clinical endpoints for trials, but in doing so, and hopefully it will start up in just a second, uh, in doing so cover uh, some of the ground that we may have missed uh, with, uh, the prior, uh, with the second uh, speaker that we're, that we're missing. These are my disclosures. So uh, the background for uh, transcatheter tricuspid valve uh, either replacement or repair or trial design uh, has to do with the guidelines and the gaps that are in these guidelines. So uh, as you can see from, uh, from this chart, the, we only have two class one indications for taking patients to surgery at this time. Uh, the asymptomatic but severe uh, patients who have uh, are, uh, at the time of left heart surgery and the symptomatic severe tricuspid regurg patients at the time of left heart surgery. But in addition, we do have some class 2A indications, and one of those is progressive functional, so that's a, a primary tricuspid regurgitation at the time of, uh, I'm sorry, secondary, uh, at the time of left heart surgery with tricuspid annular dilatation. Um, and then there's some specific cutoffs for that, which I'll review in just a second. And then also uh, for primary disease, sorry, for primary disease over on this side uh, um, of, the, of the chart, um, in the setting, again, of uh, severe symptoms. Um, but again, only two class one indications, and that's, both of those are at the time of left heart surgery. So only two uh, class two A or B indications for isolated tricuspid valve uh, repair or replacement. And the level of evidence is terrible. Um, this is really an understudied valve. And uh, as you can see, the one indication um, uh, with tricuspid annular dilatation in the absence of severe regurgitation is an annular size from a four chamber view of greater than 40 millimeters or 21 millimeters per meter, uh, per meter squared, so index to body size. And Joao already showed beautifully why this is uh, I mean, I'm going to use a relatively strong word, but a nonsensical measure, um, because it all depends on the angle at which you obtain that four-chamber view. And so this is, these guidelines really need a lot of work, and so we're designing trials now in the absence of understanding and knowledge, uh, which makes this talk really difficult. So the issues with the tricuspid regurgitation, obviously, to distinguish primary versus secondary disease, there are significant differences in presentation and pathophysiology, and then the grading of severity, because uh, it's only severe disease that at this time we have indications for taking to surgery. And so when you look at the guidelines uh, which separate uh, the diseases out into stages A, B, C, and D, the, the severe symptomatic patients, um, you must first obviously determine the morphology, and this is the same for mitral as well. But then what they've written in the guidelines is to, uh, to quantify valve hemodynamics uh, and severity of disease using a jet area of vena a single vena contracta um, uh, width, jet density uh, and contour, and hepatic vein flow reversal, uh, which is what I'm going to concentrate on first. And then we'll talk about uh, the hemodynamic consequences and uh, the fact that the symptoms are so vague uh, at fatigue, palpitations, dyspnea, bloating, and uh, anorexia and edema. So when you talk about uh, using jet area, and I'm hoping the guidelines will change, um, the problem really is, is that we have all of these different measures of uh, severity of regurgitation for tricuspid valve, but they, they have a lot of limitations. Uh, the tricuspid regurgitation jet, it turns out, um, is typically all along that septal commissure, which means that it's going to be crescent-shaped. Uh, in, in a huge percentage of the time. And, and that means that any single measure of a width uh, can be very, very misleading. So either you'll get that big width and then you'll think it's, it's you know, uh, absolutely torrential, or you'll see that narrow width and you'll think, oh, it's only mild disease. 
In addition, jet area, it turns out, um, uh, and then all of these other things are obviously just qualitative measures. Uh, reversal of flow is, is a fairly specific sign, but remember, reversal of flow in any other vessel is dependent on the compliance of the two chambers that's, that, uh, uh, um, that it's uh, involving, so the right atrial compliance and then also what's happening with the IVC. Um, but in any case, when you're using jet area, the main problem is that jet area is determined by momentum. So when you think about the pressures on the left side of the chest versus on the right, right, left side of the heart versus the right side of the heart, then the high pressures on the left side of the heart are going to create bigger jet areas for the same severity of, of regurgitant orifice than on the right side of the heart. And the 10 centimeter square that we are using for the right side is the same that we're using for the left side. So now we've taken what really is torrential disease on the tricuspid side and we're calling it severe. And this is one of the major problems now with uh, tricuspid regurgitant uh, disease and uh, the field in general, which is that we're getting to these patients way too late. Clinicians thus rely on jet areas, since the guidelines tell us to do so, uh, which we'd like to move away from. And then quantitation relies on proximal isovelocity surface area, so a single linear measurement of uh, the radius of the proximal flow. Again, um, in a time-varying jet, not really a smart idea. So uh, this is really a work in progress as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that because of that, there are other surrogates of severity that have been used. Tricuspid annular dilatation and leaflet tethering, Joel spoke about, thankfully. And um, it has to do with uh, the anatomy that Doug spoke about. So you know that the septal leaflet has multiple chordal att attachments to the septum. There's almost an innumerable number of papillary muscles uh, or direct chordal attachments of that leaflet. Consequently, uh, and in addition, there's one big papillary muscle, the anterior papillary muscle, and then a second papillary, the posterior papillary muscle, tends to be smaller. And that anterior papillary muscle is attached to the lateral wall of the RV. So as you get dilatation out from the RV, or you, have to, you start to see movement of the septum toward the LV, all of those things are going to tether up the leaflets and result in significant malcoaptation of the valve and regurgitation. Consequently, annulus size and tenting of the valve have been surrogates of severity of regurgitation, but also predict recurrence after tricuspid valve repair, so after surgical repair. So we know that the, it's not just about the annulus. It's now about the leaflet tethering and the right ventricle. Um, and uh, obviously, tenting volume a little bit harder to uh, determine. It's done on three-dimensional echo. So the importance of annular dilatation um, and the reason why it got into the guidelines is that there are numerous papers out there showing that annular dilatation is, is, is bad. And that annular plasty, this is uh, the, the infamous uh, paper by Giles Dreyfus, um, Annuloplasty based on annual dilatation associated with an improved functional status prevents progression. Annuloplasty for moderate uh, TR, so that should be TR, at the time of left heart sur surgery associated with left TR at follow up. Annuloplasty for less than moderate TR at the time of left heart surgery associated with reduced progression, improved remodeling, and better functional outcomes. All in all, this beautiful review um, uh, by Joanna Chikwe showing again that uh, in the setting of, uh, of concomitant disease on the left side that one should be thinking about annular um, uh, 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 repair, uh, an annuloplasty to arrest TR progression since it is durable, and I have, I have a real problem with that word, durable, because uh, multiple studies have shown that it recurs after five years, causes reverse RV remodeling, that's fairly strong uh, evidence, clinical improvement, again, fairly strong evidence, and trends to survival benefit, that's the kicker. No surgical study has shown a survival benefit with a tricuspid annular repair. So the, path, the third issue with tricuspid regurg is the pathophysiology of the disease. It's a volume overloaded state, which is really well tolerated for years. P pressure is not that well tolerated. Remember, the RV is thin walled. Uh, as Doug told us, it's, it's, uh, it's very, very different. It's kind of lopped onto the side of the left, of the left uh, uh, heart. And, um, and, and pressure is not tolerated well, but volume overload is tolerated well. Um, we frequently will see no reduction in RV function for a long period of time, 
partly because we, we have limited ability to, to judge RV function. We're getting better and better with strain imaging and, um, and, and other measures uh, with like uh, uh, on CMR. And then few symptoms of insidious onset. So these patients complain of a little edema. They're a little bloated. They're fatigued. Um, you know, they, they, they just don't feel right. And, and unfortunately, because this is a disease of the elderly, as so many valvular diseases are, um, many of those symptoms are attributed to aging. There is no prior interventional therapy available except surgical tricuspid valve repair or replacement, and the only guideline-directed medical therapy is a diuretic. Uh, a class two uh, uh, guideline uh, therapy is treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Poor understanding about grading and severity, we've already gone over. Color jet is also sensitive to loading conditions. So one day you can have torrential, and the next day you can have mild. It's the same thing that happens with interventions. On the table, you think you've done a perfect repair, and then they wake up, their hemodynamics change, and all of a sudden that repair is not so good. Um, just out of the box, when you look at uh, surgical repair results of, for um, uh, how much tricuspid regurgis left uh, on transthoracic echo immediately after surgery, 30% of them don't have a good result. And so uh, this is a very sensitive jet, sensitive to loading conditions. Um, and then dilatation of the right atrium results in underestimation of severity by jet area, since we know. And these pre patients present very, very late. Um, in fact, this hemodynamic consequence that we normally look at for uh, left-sided disease, so uh, we, we use right atrial, uh, left atrial dilatation as a surrogate for severity, it's very, very difficult to, to know what comes first in tricuspid regurg, the chicken or the egg. Is it that the right heart dilates and then you get tricuspid regurg? The right heart is dysfunctional and then you get tricuspid regurg? Or is the tricuspid regurg the actual culprit? And the problem is, is it's probably a little bit of both, but we know now that atrial and ventricular size um, actually will predict severity as well. And so it may be uh, that uh, tricuspid regurgitation is a consequence of all these other uh, problems like pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular dilatation. But this indeed is the type of patient that we see. This is effective regurgitant orifice area of over two centimeters squared. This is humongous. But these patients are walking around, and they're probably in everybody's practice in this room. And so we proposed uh, to increase the grading scale, since we underestimate severity of regurgitation by gel. Uh, color jet to include massive and torrential, and frankly, we've seen torrential times three coming to um, coming to our uh, interventions. So this is severe, massive torrential. You would normally have called this maybe moderate, uh, maybe even mild to moderate, but this quantified to severe, um, and this is obviously massive. And you can see the torrential nature with massive dilatation of the right atrium on the last uh, slide. And so uh, Maurizio Taramaso has proposed different phases. Uh, of, of uh, tricuspid regurgitation, with phase one being initial right ventricular dilatation with an annual dilatation without much tricuspid regurgitation. But then as the disease progresses with more dilatation and more uh, 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 right heart uh, dysfunction and, um, and tricuspid annular dilatation, you get more regurg. And then finally, you get the failure uh, where the RV is massively dilated. Uh, the, the TR is now torrential. There's pulmonary hypertension that may be involved. And although this looks like a progression, there are some patients um, uh, that don't have this, this same progression, and I think we're, 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 we're learning about those patients now. But the bottom line is this is just an example from the surgical liter literature. When you look at those patients who come for surgery, the, uh, the determinants of mortality are not only age and gender and New York Heart Association class, but liver cirrhosis, anemia, uh, poor, function, poor uh, uh, nutritional status, and renal dysfunction. All of these things tell us and the type of surgery didn't matter. Uh, so there's a lot of studies out there that say repair uh, has a better uh, in-house outcome compared to surgery. Well, it turns out that uh, to compare to replacement, but it turns out that the replacement uh, patient, the patients all have more advanced disease. And so when you normalize for that, there is no difference between in outcomes between whether or not you repair or replace. But the thing that really determines outcomes 
is how much comorbidity they have. And so we operate too late on these patients, as, you, as you've seen. So now on to the, to the bulk of the, of the talk. There's just a couple of slides here, because uh, we really don't know yet what, what we're going to do. Um, but when we look at the TR feasibility, early feasibility studies in the US, these are very small studies. Uh, sometimes uh, they require extension, as we've done with the SCOUT trial. And Chris, Chris is going to talk about that. Um, they're observational, so we're not randomizing to anything. They're not really powered at all for outcomes of any kind. And they emphasize uh, the delivery of the device uh, and technical uh, success. And then uh, care for clinical follow-up with rigorous uh, imaging analysis with exclusion, inclusion criteria is obviously uh, what seems obvious, moderate to severe, moderate or severe symptom, moderate to severe symptoms, severe or sometimes moderate, TR, uh, primary or secondary, depending on the type of device, and then the exclusion criteria, plus minus extreme or torrential TR. The FORMA trial allowed, and I think uh, uh, we'll have a talk on FORMA, um, the FORMA trial allowed absolutely torrential. There was a patient there with four centimeters squared uh, in that early trial. And then severe RV uh, dysfunction and failure typically excluded severe pulmonary hypertension with a random number of 60 millimeters of mercury um, uh, typically excluded. And then cirrhosis end stage renal disease also excluded. And their outcomes were mainly for safety. So all of these early feasibility trials are safety studies. Um, and when we look at effectiveness, again, they're not really powered to show these, but, but many echo measures of effectiveness, as well as some biomarkers, and I can tell you now that left-sided biomarkers aren't going to work for the right heart. Um, and then clinical outcomes are mainly based on functional endpoints, so six-minute walk, quality of life assessment, diuretic responsiveness, uh, edema scales and indices, edema questionnaires, uh, et cetera. And so when we go to, divide, to design our pivotal, pivotal trials, we're looking at, again, a, a, a complex risk-benefit determination, which the FDA has, is very good at. We're looking at the stability of the technology before we take it to pivotal trial. We're looking for trial designs to uh, help achieve a new standard of care. And so consequently, that standard of care uh, is dependent upon those guidelines, which obviously are significantly lacking. And so again, a relatively low bar for the tricuspid regurgitation trials. And the ultimate goal is to achieve a transcatheter approach that reduces complications of open heart surgery and provide a durable TR reduction associated with improved clinical outcomes. And so this is that now famous risk-benefit determination, John Lassinger obviously with the FDA, uh, that shows us how we make these decisions of, of balancing risk and benefit. If it's an extraordinarily low-risk procedure with no mortality, then uh, you know we're much more likely to adopt it, even if efficacy is not, not as good versus a higher risk procedure, which may be more efficacious, but has more complications associated with it. So again, it's a risk-benefit analysis for every device that comes to, uh, to trial. And the tricuspid is going to end up uh, being somewhere in there. It's never going to, because we don't believe we have, it, it would take a long and very large trial to, to show mortality benefit, we may be living in uh, uh, the relatively low risk um, uh, and relatively low efficacy, um, but low risk uh, uh, arena for the tricuspid valve. So again, pivotal trial design, we're looking at the same effectiveness by ECHO, although we are learning more about RV function and remodeling. Uh, we're looking at biomarkers and trying to figure out how to, uh, how, what biomarkers might be effective for liver function and renal function. And then um, uh, in addition to the functional endpoints, we would love to have hard outpoints, which may not include death, but may include combinations of uh, and composites of death, rehospitalization, and freedom from repeat procedures. So in sum, timing of intervention um, uh, is difficult because uh, we don't understand severe TR. We don't know how to grade it yet, but we're working on it. Uh, there are surrogates of severe TR which seem fairly robust and make a lot of pathophysiologic sense. And then there are symptoms, uh, uh, the, and then uh, the guideline-directed medical therapy is limited. And so that really opens the door for uh, these transcatheter procedures. And then the endpoints that we'll be looking at is not only efficacy from TR reduction and other echo parameters of RV remodeling, um, but hard endpoints and functional endpoints. Thanks for your attention. As Richard is setting up here, I have a question for you, Becky and Chris and the panel. I, I think, you know, one of the challenges here is that, you know, a lot of the transcatheter therapy these days are being proposed as surgical alternatives. 
you know, if you look at the path of Taver, it's a surgical replacement. Mitral, maybe, but TR, I'm not so sure. Um, as you astutely pointed out, <clears throat> there are no class one indications for surgery in these patients. So the way I look at it is that it's more of an adjunctive to medical therapy. And, uh, and, and, and the trials, I think, probably should try to reflect that. They're still being designed. I know we're on the steering committee together for to Illuminate, and I think we have to discuss these endpoints. But I think there's a huge challenge out there to re-describing what the transcatheter therapy should be. I'm uh, just curious on what your thoughts and, that, and those perspectives would be. I 100% uh, agree with you. I mean, I think because, again, uh, we don't have that that the strong outcomes data from surgery. And it's very hard for us, if, if you isolated tricuspid valve uh, surgery is associated with an 8.8% .8 mortality, in-house mortality, it, it, it's, it, it's a pretty low bar for us, I think, by, with transcatheter and, and it's, devices. It's 13% if you're replacing. <laughs> so, and and so, so every tricuspid surgery is high risk, so it's almost like it doesn't matter. It's not really, we're not really trying to replace a high-risk procedure. Yeah. I think we're more trying to determine, well, what role would this have in an average patient who's being managed with diuretics currently? Um, so, because yeah. I, I don't ever see a randomization against surgery in the works. I, I, I just I don't not. think that's going to happen. I hope not, because yeah. you are then committing a clinician to giving their patient either a new device or a 10% chance of dying. Exactly. And I just don't think anyone can live with that. So we will never randomize, I don't think, I don't believe, I don't believe we should. Right. We should never randomize yeah. to surgery. Right. This should only be randomized right. against guideline-directed medical right. therapy. Yeah, so then it becomes a medical therapy trial. Yeah. And we have to avoid falling in the co uh, into the co-op trap, you know, and making things very difficult to enroll and randomize. Uh, but I do see it that way and, I, and, and hopefully, we can take the surgical risk discuss discussions out of this. I think those are great points, Paul. I mean, the challenge is one. The one part that will make it a lot easier to co op from a medical management is uh, it's just diuretics. You know, it, it's, it gets a little easier. But there is a lot of art to that, too. And, I mean, you know, switching patients to torsamide from Lasix, really, are they really diuretics or not? I mean, it's hard to assess in a lot of these patients. Uh, it just the, the endpoints are going to be so challenging because we've seen, you know, with Triline, is, it, we'll talk about it in a bit, but, you know, a, a lot of these devices, they all leave a reasonable amount of TR no matter what you do, but these patients feel a lot better. And now we've got to probably base a trial on how much better patients feel, which there's a lot of challenges in trying to have a trial that that's the hard endpoints in it. And then on top of it, if that's your endpoint, then getting the buy-in from our cardiology colleagues across the spectrum to say, okay, well, you did this to this patient. They still got a reasonable amount of TR. I know you think they feel better, but, you know, am I really going to start sending my patients like it is for TAVR or for MR, where do you really see these differences? I think it adds so many layers of complexity to seeing these devices move forward as quick as we've seen in the other spaces, you know. I mean, I guess we have a little time here. I mean, what moderate TR is often the, is the current entry criterion for Triluminate. And, but we're trying to get patients to decrease by one grade, so they may only go from torrential to severe. So how, how, do we, how do we reconcile that the entry criteria is less in terms of severity than the eventual goal? You know, so in other words, you're enrolling moderate patients, but we're accepting that it's only one grade reduction, which may be severe or massive. How do, how do we reconcile that? Can I add one layer of complexity to that problem? My biggest challenge is you're exactly right with that, but the problem is it may be moderate yesterday, and then without doing a single different thing, a day later it's like torrential. I mean, almost. I mean, it, that's the hardest thing to think is it is insane how much I'm going to show a patient with we had this thing with where you could just it, the variability with small changes in volume status or pressure management. It's incredible, and what that does is it just complicates the actual. Uh, actual regurgitin, how much regurgitation we actually have in measuring that, and that's where all these other parameters we need to really find that become relevant instead because I don't know what to make of half that data. We have these TR cases where TR is gone at the end of the case, we're high five and all that stuff. The next day their TR does not look so hot that the, you know, on TTE, they come back in 30 days and they feel like a million dollars, and I'm looking at their echo, I'm like, are you sure? You know, and so th th it's that's a little when I have Richard turn the echo. Yeah, we tried it. We've, we've been working on that. That's stop, the real stop, plan. Yeah, yeah, stop looking. Yeah, stop exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's such a hemodynamically variable uh, jet. Um, but the effective regurgitant orifice area may not be as 
uh, as variable. And so we're trying to come up with ways, and it may end up being, you know, using multimodality, I mean, multiple modalities to confirm the regurgitant orifice area or the anatomic regurgitant orifice area. But also, as Chris says, to look at the other, we should see RV remodeling. We should see an increase in forward flow. We uh, should see improvement in liver function or, or renal function. I, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. We, uh, the reliance on collagen and many other things, you know, for me it's very clear that it's the forgotten valve, not for a reason. It's because it's missed. It flies under the radar screen and, you know, it goes by so many years and we go back and said it was severe back two, three years ago. What are they talking about then? So it's undercalled, it's underreported, it's incredibly variable. So I think we need more specific clinical combined with some anatomical. It, it has to be multifactorial. Now the question is, if they feel so much better, we do the interventions and we still see sometimes a lot of TR. Should we consider sham procedure? That's <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think I, I think it's either a sham or you have to have some imaging to document why the patients feel better. Uh, I, yeah. I I don't think it can be just six minute walk and KCCQ, and so so there are some who are actually pushing for uh, RV volumes uh, and MRI uh, as 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 being the hard endpoint uh, or at least one of the hard endpoints, kind of like the CTSN study. Uh, that use LV and systolic volume indexed uh, for secondary MR. Um, I don't know if we're ready to do that, and I don't know if there are enough centers that have expertise like, you know, Joao and others to do uh, such advanced imaging. Uh, at the very least, there should be a sub-study, I think, to, to support the uh, clinical trial endpoint. All right. We should move on. Richard, sorry to have you standing up no, there. No. TE imaging for procedure planning. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Um, my disclosure. So I'm just a simple echo guy, you know, and, uh, but we do, we like to stay in our comfort zone, you know, so we're used to imaging the aortic valve, so TAVR wasn't kind of in the green zone in the pain scale. You know, when MitraClip came along, before we had 3D 10 years ago, it was probably in the orange range, and now over time it's kind of moved to the left. And I have to be honest, when Paul said we're going to clip the tricuspid valve, between the septal and anterior leaflet. I was kind of in the red there for a while. And uh, so hopefully we can get with some knowledge and some pattern recognition under your belts. If you start doing this, uh, hopefully we can keep you from going in the red. So this is going to continue on from that excellent anatomy talk, uh, uh, specific uh, echo imaging for the tricuspid valve with an eye towards intervention. So as mentioned before, it can be very technically challenging, and that adds to the stress. You got thin leaflets. 3D is not as good as uh, with easy as the mitral valve. You can get a lot of dropout. You can get shadowing from the septum or the aortic root. We're not really used to identifying specific uh, views for uh, specific leaflet pairs, anterior septal, posterior septal, anterior posterior. Uh, you know, with mitral valve, you got one commissure to deal with. Now you got three. And it's, you know, honestly much more difficult to guide tricuspid interventions than mitral. With that being said, uh, as mentioned before, don't forget the transthoracic imaging because in some cases uh, it may give you a better view than your TEE. So we'll just go through kind of simplistically to try to uh, go through the various images for specific leaflet pairs. If you get a really nice RV inflow, you don't really see any septum, that's one transthoracic view where you can uh, see the anterior and posterior leaflets. If you start seeing a little bit, this is not an ideal example, but if you start seeing a little bit of uh, LV and, uh, the, and the septum, you, you know, the septal leaflet's usually easy to identify, because if you see the septum, you know you have the septal leaflet. Uh, but that usually will give you a septal anterior. And uh, this is a very important view, both by transthoracic and by TEE, is the short axis view. It's kind of, I would say it's analogous to the uh, commissural view for MitraClip. So as mentioned before, if you're close to the aortic valve, you're going to be kind of uh, looking where the anterior and septal leaflets would be. And as you move more laterally, uh, you would eventually get into more of a posterior. Apical four chamber view, if you have the LV opened up, uh, you know, it's usually septal and anterior. Uh, if you start seeing a little bit of coronary sinus and the LV uh, starting to get small, usually you're moving back more towards septal and posterior. Uh, don't forget to look at the hepatic veins. 
but we'll go to TEE now because that's what we've been mainly using during our uh, tricuspid clip uh, cases. So uh, analogous to the apical four chamber view, if you see the LV opened up, you see the septum, so you know that you see the septal leaflet. It's usually the challenge is are you looking at anterior or posterior leaflet uh, otherwise. So in this view, this, these both images were in the same patient. You can see this patient has a pacemaker lead kind of deep uh, between the septal and posterior leaflets. So in this view, uh, in the four chamber view, we see the septal and anterior leaflets. If you push the probe a little bit deeper, or if you uh, extend your probe, you see a little bit of coronary sinus coming in, and uh, now you'll have septal and posterior leaflets. And that, this is the 3D from the same patient. Now you can see the uh, pacemaker lead coming into view. So the short axis view is very important, and if you use X-plane, it's kind of like uh, when you do mitroclip with a commissural and uh, grasping views. If you put your X-plane uh, cursor closer to the aortic valve, uh, then your orthogonal view, you'll get the septal, should get the septal and anterior leaflets. Uh, and if you move more laterally, you should get the septal and posterior leaflets. This is a transgastric view of that same patient. You can see up here, you don't really see uh, any septal leaflet. This patient previously had an EP ablation, and, and this anterior part of the septal leaflet is just adherent to the uh, septum. So uh, you don't really see it, but that's kind of the analogous view. And th this also highlights that the uh, transgastric view uh, often can be uh, more helpful than a 3D view uh, in localization. This also highlights that patients can have quite variable anatomy. This is pretty much a bicuspid, tricuspid uh, leaflet. There's not really much of a commissure between the anterior and uh, posterior leaflets. So again, if we move the cursor more to the side, uh, Here's the little carrot there. Uh, then you should get more septal uh, and posterior leaflet in your orthogonal view. And here we can see the septal leaflets coming a little bit off the septum. So then if you just go to your orthogonal uh, view, you know, that's our, our, our grasping view, usually somewhere between 140 and 180. And uh, this is what you would use to kind of focus in uh, on your grasp. If you don't have, go from the X-plane to the uh, uh, grasping view, you know, this view you could be seeing anterior and septal or posterior and septal. Sometimes it can be a little bit uh, confusing. Um, another helpful view is actually if you advance the probe even further, go back down to your uh, zero degree or 25 degree view and get a deep esophageal view. So sometimes patients with uh, lipomatous septums, it shadows the valve uh, quite a bit and it makes it difficult to see. But if you go into that deep esophageal view, uh, you can uh, get rid of the uh, septum out of the picture and that can help you. You can also use this view for grasping. Sometimes we've used this lower angle as opposed to the higher angle. But again, the transgastric view, I think we found has been critical uh, for these procedures. Uh, it really gives you a nice uh, view of uh, the three leaflets, coaptation, and, and can help you with localization of where the TR is coming from. As I mentioned before, 3D can be quite variable. If you have a little bit of sclerotic leaflets and uh, you, know, you might get a really nice 3D uh, image. Uh, this is that patient with that adherent anterior septum. And this person had thinner leaflets, and so you can get this moth-eaten dropout, but it can still be helpful. But oftentimes you'll get just something like this that is really hard to interpret, and that's where the transgastric really helps you. Don't forget from TE, you can also you know, interrogate the hepatic veins. And uh, sometimes you get this eccentric TR that gives you this coronary sinus uh, reversal. So I'm just gonna uh, finish with this illustrative case. This is a, uh, a woman that had, uh, I, I think we would agree that that's probably torrential TR to begin with, just a huge coaptation gap. And uh, she developed heart block, so the EP physician said, well, we don't wanna put a pacemaker lead through that tricuspid valve, let's just put a coronary sinus lead in. And unfortunately, they put a little too much slack in there, so you can see it just prolapses into the tricuspid inflow doesn't necessarily help things out here. It's probably not an ideal candidate to do as your first case, but uh, 
Here's a, a, a little bit of a 3D view from the right atrial side, and you can see the pacemaker lead into the coronary sinus, but you can just see this part of the pacemaker wires just swinging across the uh, uh, tricuspid annulus. So um, if we attempted intervention here, that, that could certainly get in the way of your device. Here's just a, a few TE views also showing that there's just a lot of TR here. And it looks like it's mostly between the anterior and septal uh, leaflet, but central component as well. So um, Paul snared uh, the tricuspid, uh, I mean the uh, pacemaker wire, and kind of pulled up down the slack into the uh, IVC to get that out of the way. And uh, it's kind of like MitraClip once you get the right views. Uh, you just want to get the two leaflet pairs. You want to see uh, um, the leaflets resting on the arms. And uh, technically, otherwise, that it's a similar grasp. So it was, the gap was too wide to go right for the money. So we started further out in uh, the septal and the anterior commissure. And here you see our first clip on the 3D. And you still see a lot of TR, but uh, we brought the leaflets a little bit closer together. Um, and then we have a second uh, right near the middle, the septal and anterior leaflet, right down uh, centrally. And uh, it's kind of a clip and zip approach, but uh, to our surprise, we got quite a nice result uh, with two clips there. And the transthoracic the next day. Um, still some TR, but certainly a significant improvement. So typically we'll go uh, septal anterior, septal posterior uh, with our grasp, but you can do anterior uh, posterior grasp. Uh, that's a little more difficult uh, for imaging. Um, so this patient, uh, we put one clip septal anterior to begin with, and then now we're grasping uh, anterior to posterior. So it's kind of like a here is about 80, 75 degree view uh, and tilting till you see the two leaflet pairs of the anterior and posterior leaflet. I think if you're lucky and from a transgastric view, uh, your clip arms are right in alignment with that commissure, you could use a transgastric uh, X-plane as well. Um, uh, and here you see we've grasped uh, the uh, both the septal and the anterior leaflet and the anterior to the posterior leaflet. So it can be done, uh, but it's technically challenged. You have thin leaflets, drop out with 3D, use your transgastric view, that'll help you a lot. You can get shadowing from the septum, use a deeper esophageal window that can get that out of the way. Um, and as you're thinking about the procedure, think about which views are gonna be best to image your specific leaflet pairs for your target. Uh, and it's much more difficult to guide than uh, the tricuspid interventions and the mitral, but if you're patient and persevere, uh, it can be done. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I think we are going to have to move on, but uh, everybody stay up here, and if we have time at the end, we'll, uh, we'll take questions. So uh, we're moving on to um, interventions, and uh, Chris Maduri will speak about uh, transcatheter plication probably annual application. All righty, let's get going here. Great, so uh, thanks again for having me at this great meeting. Uh, I'm really excited about using my uh, AirPods on the way home uh, on the flight, and uh, really you guys have done a, Paul, uh, everybody here has done a great job, and I think um, I really like the dialogue and discussion here. So I want to try to bring us around now to the interventional aspect of this talk. And, you know, we've already kind of alluded to the fact that there's a lot starting to go on, but we really don't understand all this space that that well. So I'm going to talk about the Triline device, which is really kind of the first one moving out forward in the tricuspid space. And so this is the Triline procedure, and the steps are as follows. So uh, essentially, we're trying to perform a bicuspidization of the tricuspid annulus uh, by doing a posterior plication. That's a lot of big words kind of going in there. But what we do is we actually come underneath the tricuspid annulus with the catheter. We deliver a wire up above. Uh, through the tricuspid annulus, we snare it, we then pull through that snare, the, a pledget system, uh, we then deliver a pledget, then we do that again in a second spot, and then we bring those two things together to kind of pull that annulus further together. 
And the nice thing about this is that we have the ability to kind of really customize things depending on the patient's anatomy. So if you really think about this technology, you really have the ability, if it's a little less dilate, not as quite as much dilation, you could put one pair in. Uh, you could do two different ways of two pairs. So you could then, if it's more, you could do a classic K procedure, which is where the surgeons used to actually just put sutures here to do this instead. And that's for, we think, maybe more moderate severe dilation. And then you could do like more of a series pair if you think you have an even more dilation. And really the nice thing about this is you're only leaving behind these little sutures, so you really leave the door open for any other thing you need to do down the road. So I'm gonna show you this early feasibility results, Becky and myself for the PIs for this trial. And um, you know, I think the summary here is that th these are complex patients. You know, most of these patients had prior mitral valve surgery. As we alluded to earlier, a majority of these patients have had some kind of arrhythmia disorder in the past, and they're all on diuretic therapy as well. Actually, that's uh, coming off, sorry. It is actually 100% diuretic therapy. I'm not sure why it comes across that way. So the big thing with these pa this technology is that this was a very, very safe technology. Is when we looked at that slide that Becky showed earlier about where these technologies fall of appropriateness and what we want to actually use, we think that we want to have something that we know is very safe because, you know, the efficacy in these isn't like a TAVR in the tricuspid spirits. This is something where we're going to have a little bit more of a gray zone of how incredibly efficacious it potentially is. So, again, 30 day mortality, free from any mortality. There really was only one procedural technical issue, and that was really only uh, one unplanned surgery that the patient did fine from as well later. Uh, and then there was one actual also time where there was a right coronary artery that needed to be stented because, as we mentioned earlier, the right coronary artery runs behind the tricuspid annulus. So when you do cinch there, some you can actually narrow the right coronary artery as well. So if you look at actually the 39 patients with this data now, 30 days, 100% free uh, from all cause mortality, and only one patient passed away uh, within the first year for the technology. So I think it does show that there is actually a robust safety signal with this technology. And as we alluded to earlier, honestly, the most impressive thing we see with this, and I think with most of the tricuspid devices, is the improvement in quality of life. And it goes to kind of what we need to base things off, because it is a little bit tricky when we use these things. But there was very robust improvements in Minnesota living with heart failure, which I'm MYJ class as well as with six minute walk test. Now, what not, is not necessarily quite as robust is the reduction in TR. So we have a reasonable reduction in tricuspid annular diameter, tricuspid valve area, and we talk about PISA ERA about the per protocol patients. We look at this having about, you know, 40% reduction in that. And, uh, you know, I think in summary, when we think of this technology, we think of it as being a safe, safe, safe procedure with a moderate reduction in TR, maybe compared to a few of the other technology in this space. Now, what's interesting and challenging when we alluded earlier to the idea that, you know, we get excited in the procedure, we see this really the TR going away, but then we might see in follow-up it's a little different, is this, this is the actual data. So we said about 30, 35% post-procedure, uh, the 30-day reduction in TR. But what's challenging is interprocedurally, the two largest volume centers, Northwestern and Piedmont, and we're presenting this at TCT this year, we had much greater reductions in the actual ERA reduction interprocedurally. And the reason I think this is actually important and it may become more relevant in this space is, yes, there are some changes of volume and pressure in the middle of the case, but this is the one time where we actually have a true change in endpoint. So we started the procedure, we had a quantification in this patient, and we finished the procedure, and there wasn't that much changing in between. And so I do think down the stream, it'll be important to look in these technologies, their interprocedural changes, and better try to extrapolate and understand that, knowing that, that we lack all those other variables within that as well, outside of that. So I want to kind of take us home with just what I think is really unique about this technology. So this is actually the first patient we ever treated. So it's a 76-year-old female. She had massive, severe to massive TR, class three heart failure, prior mitral valve surgery, AFib, Chronic coronary disease, et cetera, et cetera. So she was enrolled in our Scout 1 EFS, and she was successfully initially treated with the procedure with just one pair, and that was all we had at that time. Now, at the end of the procedure, we had mild to moderate TR, and you know, it was our first case, we were happy about that. And she, as you're going to see here, she was really having more TR and follow up, but she felt great. I mean, this woman felt phenomenal. I mean, she would literally call the news networks in our local city and said, I got to tell you about how great I feel this new technology is doing Piedmont. It was really incredible. And so because of that, her TR came back over time, we, you know, and her symptoms eventually came back. And so we submitted her for compassionate user retreatment. 
So here's what we had initially seen. So we had done the initial procedure, just one plication. Everything looked pretty good. Our proposal for the second procedure is we're going to do a replication. We're going to actually do, essentially do a classic K. Uh, so we would now done another plication on the first one. And then we're going to do another plication farther up the annulus. And so this was her case initially. So at the end, the starting screen TTE, we had a PCORA of 0.68. It discharged post the first plication. 0.38. So we went to moderate severe afterwards. And this is by Becky's core lab, so you know it is exactly right. So um, now what happened after that is, so this is the results of how she kind of trended afterwards. So EFS patient, if you look at her trend in TR, you can see that around three months to six months, you know, again, this always varies a lot. There's a still a amount of TR. But again, she felt phenomenal. And around 22, 23 months, it's really started to kick in. And you see that I think what we naturally see in these patients is that just, just a natural progression over time, these disease processes likely are to come back. So here's a brief image of our retreatment. So you can see there's a whole lot of these things here now. So again, we did the first two plications really around the first one, and then we did an additional, this is the final plication, uh, again, a little bit more up the annulus. And you can appreciate just that the plicating is you can actually see us closing here under 3D, and the, really the color did get significantly better. And so at the beginning of the procedure, or this is her pre-stuff, she had an ERA of 0.61. Afterwards, ERA of 0.23. Actually, don't have her final images as follow-up here, but actually now it's even better, actually, surprise looking. So it's actually mild, traced a mild TR now. I mean, she feels so much better again. And I think it really opens the idea that I think this is a novel technology, because I do think, as Besky alluded to, most patients TR with surgical repair, they come back four or five years later. And I think that's because this is a functional process. We have never stopped the fundamental problem of what caused our TR in the first place. We're just trying to address some of what it's caused downstream. And when we do that, the process is going to come back every single time and we do repair patients. And so having a technology where it's relatively easy, maybe not quite as robust in the initial re uh, reduction, but that you can relatively easily retreat, may be in a very effective strategy for how we look at these patients downstream. Again, here is her total ERA reduction here or sorry, her valve area reduction. So again, trial line, again, it allows you to customize things. I think that makes it unique. I think the technology is very safe. Again, modest reductions of TR with very strong improvements in quality of life. I think it's avenues for treatment downstream could be, if we we're talking about who we need to treat, it's probably earlier. And this could be an incredibly good technology for people earlier because it is very safe. Um, and for people that may potentially need more retreatments downstream. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Oh, um, yep, so I guess Paul will go next, but we, yeah, we, and talk about CLIP, feasibi uh, the feasibility experience. Don't we Great. have space? Thank you very much, Becky, and good morning to all of you. And I uh, certainly want to thank you all again for being here at our second uh, annual uh, Cardiovascular Innovations. And uh, hopefully you, uh, you enjoyed uh, these past several days and look forward to coming back uh, next year. So I want to thank you all for helping us make this meeting successful. So I'm going to talk about MitraClip, and uh, unfortunately, because there's not a whole lot of experience out there, Richard and I do share uh, some similar slides. So I apologize uh, if you've just seen this. And this is, again, that 82-year-old woman who came to us with a, a TR. And at that time, I didn't know what torrential or massive uh, was, but I just knew that it was a lot. Uh, and, uh, and I learned yesterday uh, that at Piedmont, when it's important, they say that it's a lot. And so, uh, so, and just as uh, and just as uh, Richard showed you, we did had to get the the sinus lead out of the way. But despite that, there continued to be uh, kind of persistent, uh, significant TR, which then we we, we then went in with uh, one and then two clips. As you can see here, they're both placed on the anteroceptal uh, pair of the uh, tricuspid valve, and we got a really nice result. She's done really well, and this is uh, off-label therapy. And so it's really interesting, and I, I would love to share with you uh, the off-label experience. We're still in the process of collecting that in the United States, but we estimate somewhere between 120 and 150 cases have been done in the United States off-label. Worldwide, I learned uh, two weeks ago that it's over 1,000 now. And so this, by far, is the most common transcatheter therapy for tricuspid regurgitation in the world uh, currently. And it's simply because we're able to leverage uh, a lot of what we know from MitraClip and apply it to uh, the tricuspid valve, uh, as you've seen uh, here. 
So here's one paper that describes the uh, initial experience. This is George Nikonik's paper, 64 patients, 88% of whom had functional TR. Uh, about a third of them had had the procedure combined uh, with uh, mitroclip, and 90% of them got some uh, significant reduction uh, with off-label use uh, of uh, the mitroclip for these patients. Now, I've learned a lot uh, since being on the uh, Charluminate uh, Committee with Becky. Uh, you know, we started uh, our feasibility study uh, last uh, 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 fall uh, with the first patient enrolled in, in, in August. And uh, there's a lot that uh, we really have learned. And so I'll just share with you a couple of nuggets here. Uh, Richard uh, showed you some of these images earlier. If you look at this, uh, if there's one, uh, uh, a few take home messages, I would tell you, learn how to do TEE for TR. So if you look at the top left hand side, and this is what Becky has really uh, pioneered the way here, this is a short axis view showing that commissural uh, view of the tricuspid valve. And you can see that most of that TR is close to the aortic valve. And so it looks like it's probably uh, more anoroceptal. And so if then if you look on the top right hand side, what Richard has done is he's dropped a cursor and explained off of that area. And you leave the explained on uh, with that cursor recorded so you know that on the right side of the top right panel, you know which pair of leaflets you're looking at for grasping. Uh, and if you don't put that cursor there, you don't know which level you're looking at across the tricuspid plane. And I think, if anything, that is probably the singular most important message that I learned so that I can know which pair of leaflets I'm looking at across that commissure uh, of, uh, of the top left. We then, uh, so if you go in the top right down to the bottom left, uh, we then just, after we've dropped the cursor on that pair of leaflets, we then uh, focus on just the pair, uh, because as you know, uh, and I've learned, I'm not an echo doctor, but I've learned that when you go out of X-plane into uh, just single view, that your resolution improves. So you can see in the top left, uh, bottom left, that you see a much better view of the leaflets you're focusing on, and you can see whether or not the clip is gonna be able to grasp those leaflets. And then to confirm, uh, we look in the transgastric views, uh, which again, Becky has really led the way here in describing uh, how to do this. And you look in the bottom right, you look at these, and you, measure, you start doing things like measuring gaps. And so there are going to be patients in whom uh, there's a physical limit uh, to uh, the mitroclip system. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the current generation is both NTR and XTR. Uh, thank goodness for XTR because we get an extra three millimeters on either side of the arms. Uh, but there's going to be a physical limit to how far these, uh, these uh, clips can, uh, can reach. And in the current off-label uh, use, we commonly describe gaps of five, uh, maybe seven uh, as approachable, but ideally less than five. And so here, here's a patient here. You can look top left-hand side, clearly uh, just uh, uh, a lot of TR is what I'm going to say. And then uh, the uh, top right, uh, transgastric, showing that short axis with color, showing a lot of color going through the anoroceptal pair. And then if you look at the middle, uh, bottom middle, uh, this is where uh, Becky and Richard will me measure gaps. And you can see here the gap is enormous. Uh, and, and because of that enormous gap, you simply cannot pull that together uh, with uh, triclip uh, tri therapy. And sometimes it's not just the gaps. Sometimes it's just simply you just can't see. Uh, and this is a patient with a, a huge limbus. Uh, and we knew that there's a lot of TR. I don't think there's any doubt about the amount of color that's coming back there. But despite multiple different views, we just couldn't get around and see the leaflets very well. And we all know uh, that you can't treat uh, what you can't see. And then finally, I would say that, you know, Becky uh, talked about this earlier in terms of clinical endpoints. I think one of the things we're going to struggle with, well, what is meaningful? So here, here's a patient in the top uh, left, uh, baseline uh, TR, uh, and then we put a clip on. And I can tell you that uh, as a perfectionist, uh, I wasn't really happy with this. I wanted to see more uh, TR go away. But look what happened here in terms of her RE pressure. Uh, RE pressure normalized, and she became completely asymptomatic and remains asymptomatic uh, two years later. And I think well, we have a lot to learn. And, uh, and I would love to have a few more hours with Becky and Richard to talk about how we're going to quantitate these patients, because uh, there, uh, there are challenges there. So the feasibility study uh, for Charluminate is uh, really getting closer to uh, wrapping up. Uh, you know, uh, this is a uh, CE mark study uh, with the feasibility centers, uh, feasibility study being done in the United States simultaneously. It's moderate or worse, single arm therapy. Uh, we expect us to wrap up uh, this fall. 
And then uh, David Adams, uh, Dr. David Adams and I are the national PI so for our True Illuminate. And that study will kick off uh, most likely in the first quarter of this year uh, as a pivotal study. Uh, so this, uh, this is uh, no longer feasibility. Uh, as David describes, uh, it's the playoffs. And so, so we're very excited to see how that turns out. So thank you very much. Great. We'll, we'll talk about spacers now. And Markham will come up and um, enlighten us about uh, this therapy. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about spacer therapy. I'd like to thank uh, Paul for the invitation to be here. And uh, I'll get started and try to uh, make up for uh, that we're running behind here. Okay. All right, so um, we'll talk about the investigational forma early feasibility study during this talk. And I'll start with a case, similar to some of the other cases you've seen. This is a 69-year-old woman with class three dyspnea, abdominal fullness, lower extremity edema, managed with high-dose diuretics, and previous bypass grafting surgery, type one diabetes, stage three chronic kidney disease, and also paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. This is her echocardiogram. You can see on the top left the uh, annular dilatation in the RV inflow view and then the significant color Doppler jet, as Paul would say, a lot of TR. And then the, the continuous wave Doppler showing a dense dagger-shaped signal. And then your flow reversals present in the hepatic veins during systole. So all findings of severe TR. And the 3D echo helps us understand the mechanism a little bit more and that you see a central, a large central jet of tricuspid regurgitation. And really the mechanism here was annular dilatation, what we've been talking about. And this seems to be the most common type of mechanism that I see in my patients is patients with chronic AFib and progressive atrial enlargement that then results in annular dilatation and TR. So the Forma repair system is probably the most simple technique of all the ones that you've heard about today. It really is kind of the opposite of the, the annular reduction. So it's a spacer that's positioned in the regurgitant orifice, and it creates a platform for native leaflet coaptation, and it's positioned over a rail that is anchored in the interventricular groove of the right ventricle, and then also in the prepectoral fascia, and it's delivered via a subclavian approach. It's available in three sizes, and really only the 12 and 15 millimeters have been used to a significant degree and only a couple of cases using the 18 millimeter device at this point. As part of the evaluation, a gated cardiac CTA is essential and it helps define the subclavian anatomy and ensure that there's adequate um, size for the delivery of the sheath and the device. And then also to look at the anatomy of the RV, look at the moderator band, if you've heard um, talking about the importance of existing pacemaker leads, and then identifying a coaxial site for that anchor deployment. And this is the RV gram that we did during the procedure, kind of showing the beautiful anatomy of this massively uh, enlarged uh, RV and atrium. And we use this RV gram to identify the site of the anchor. And this is based on a, a projection that was predicted by the CT. So the former procedure involves a steerable catheter that's delivered by a subclavian approach, left subclavian approach, and it's balloon tipped, and we navigate it into the RV, and this is what it looks like on fluoroscopy. And then the anchor is positioned very carefully. This is the most critical part of the procedure. We use transgastric TEE guidance to confirm that that anchor is in the place where we want it to be, and then also uh, cine angiography to confirm that as well. And once that anchor is in place, then we can track the spacer over the rail and then position that and fine tune the positioning based on tension on the rail and positioning of the spacer uh, using TEE guidance. So in this patient that we were talking about, this is her baseline TR before the Forma device and then immediately after you can see that spacer sitting there and you see some reduction in the color jet. But of course this is very difficult to quantitate uh, as uh, Becky knows very well as being the core lab for this study. Um, but you can see, we, uh, she'll be happy to see that we have 3D vena contractus here on this slide. And you can see that that reduced significantly, the 3D vena contracta area. Uh, 
and then the reversal TVIs in the hepatic veins also reduce significantly acutely. So it's important to collect this detailed echo data in these patients. And you can see that starting out, this patient really was in, the, in that torrential group, uh, or massive to torrential group. You can see uh, a reduction in the right atrial pressure, similar to what Paul just showed you. You see kind of a ventricularized waveform at baseline, and then immediately after the spacer is put in, you see an acute reduction in the RA pressure. And what's been encouraging is that these patients seem to have a progressive improvement in follow-up. Uh, we can see that the six-minute walk distance improved at one month and, and six months sequentially in this particular patient. NT pro BNP reduced, and the bilirubin also reduced. So the hepatic congestion is going down in these patients. And you can see that potentially even the RV size has decreased at six months, although this is probably a limited evaluation with echo, as we've heard, um, and perhaps MRI could give us more definitive data about that. You can see the uh, six-month changes in EROA, about a, almost a 50 percent reduction in the EROA in this patient at six months. And the systolic flow reversals in the hepatic veins have pretty much gone, uh, gone away at six months. So this is excellent uh, progress in this one patient. But what about the early feasibility trial? And this was 30 patients with secondary or also called isolated TR due to annular dilatation, excluding patients with primary TR, pulmonary hypertension, advanced kidney disease, or inadequate subclavian anatomy. And there were five sites that uh, were involved in the study, and Sushil Kadali presented the 30-day results at TCT. The patients were uh, elderly and predominantly female. You can see 67% women, high STS score, and also high prevalence of atrial fibrillation and right heart failure. And just to uh, you know, show what Becky was talking about, this is the, the spectrum of EROA in this population. And about two-thirds of these patients had torrential TR. So this is really uh, the, the most extreme state of disease. And I think the Forma is probably one of the more suited devices for this because of the simple nature of it and just the mechanism. So the study flow, uh, 30 patients initially included. One procedure was aborted because of inadequate uh, vein anatomy. There were two episodes of RV perforation during the procedure, one of which resulted in death, one of which converted to surgery, and that patient survived and did well. And then uh, 27 patients had the device uh, successfully implanted. There was one episode of device migration, which required explantation. That patient subsequently died after 30 days, and then an explant due to infection as well. Interestingly, there were two anchor dislodgements, and uh, the spacer remained in the desired position, and those patients have been followed uh, serially. So there were 25 patients available for 30-day echo follow-up. These are the endpoints. Death occurred in 7% of patients at 30 days, and major bleeding was uh, occurred in 14%. And you can see cardiac surgery was required in three patients, so 10% of the patients in this initial experience with the device. But it's important to note that 69% that of patients had none of these above events, and this is the first time this device was ever implanted in the United States. So you can see the EROA reduced significantly in the majority of patients, about a 40 to 50% reduction at 30 days. And the NYHA class also improved similar to what you've seen in, these, in the other device experiences. So uh, the majority of patients, 70%, were NYHA class one or two at 30 days. And this was reflected by the six minute walk distance, uh, an improvement of about 40 meters at 30 days, and also the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. And these results mirror what we've seen in the compassionate use experience with the Forma device, uh, which is, is in uh, 18 patients international experience. The results with this were actually, uh, there were no episodes of mortality at 30 days or one year, um, even though this was the first time the device had ever been placed, and uh, really a low rate of adverse events in general. And a similar improvement in six-minute walk distance at 30 days and one year 
and Kansas City uh, cardiomyopathy quality of life, but really detailed echo data and other markers were not available in this population. We're really interested in those other endpoints as Becky has already talked about. So in summary, in a patient cohort with torrential TR and multiple comorbidities, the former repair system was feasible and the next generation is about to be rolled out later on this year through the early feasibility study. And that'll have improvements in device delivery and safety to help reduce um, the, the risk of uh, dislodgement and perforation. And despite torrential TR in most patients, there was significant reduction in EROA, especially in the people with more severe disease, and also improvements in quality of life and six minute walk distance. Thanks for your attention. Excellent. Um, I think we actually have time for maybe a little bit of a minute. No, I think uh, John doesn't have to talk right now. Is that so, uh, our apologies. Okay. There was a, a mix up in the AV, and uh, uh, Dr. Carroll was told that uh, he would be moderating a session with this, the talk of his title, not giving a presentation. So, but, but maybe we can just open up, John, maybe just some comments. I mean, your thoughts yeah. on how do we get this therapy to be accepted in a commercial practice and change some of the guidelines uh, which are currently limited? What do you think? Well, I think this has been a great session uh, for understanding the uh, multifaceted problems in, in this area. And you start with the clinical issue that it is a chronic volume overload lesion where the natural history is very prolonged. Detection of the initial of the disease itself is uh, likely to be uh, late. Uh, there's not a loud murmur. There's not a short natural history with a real risk of cardiac death like with aortic stenosis. And those uh, are all, and there's not the guideline directed medical management we have for functional MR. TR is just such a uh, problematic uh, area. And we don't have the long history of surgical approach to the disease uh, to give us guidance, both in terms of what works and patient selection, and especially in approaching isolated uh, TR uh, patients. So it's, it's, uh, challenging. Then you add to it uh, the probably, I would conclude the image guidance really hasn't been um, developed to the point of, of allowing us to see what we're doing from a transcatheter standpoint in a predictable nature. Some people have good TEs, some have good transthoracics, perhaps ICE will help fill that gap and we'll have to individualize, but uh, it means it's just uh, um, the image guidance is actually be as far behind as coming up with a device that clearly is, is effective. So on the one hand, it's a low bar for FDA clearance because I think if you could have a very safe therapy, uh, which is not, as we've seen with some of the results, uh, not quite there, um, and it doesn't have to be efficacious from a traditional standpoint of eliminating or reducing to mild the hemodynamic uh, uh, parameters, but like Paul's patient that he presented who uh, you know, had significant residual TR but was asymptomatic. So if you could have predictability in a clinical outcome like that, then I think it's a lower bar for FDA to approve because it fulfills those tenets of, of the lack of good alternatives, both medical and surgical a very symptomatic patient population uh, with no alternatives, and so it's a low bar for a transcatheter therapy as long as it's not harmful or, and hopefully more predictable. Uh, finally, I would say uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, the people on this panel are the pioneers, and it's going to be a, a slow, long haul to um, really understand the disease better and the various therapeutic options. And I just got back from the MedCAC meeting where we were talking about whether 584 TAVR sites is enough for the United States. I think in this sort of area, 
if there is something that achieves FDA approval, which would probably be in a limited fashion, and perhaps even an HDE, a humanitarian device exemption status, although device companies generally don't like that, uh, this would be a therapy that would have to be very restricted to sites because you've seen the challenges here, uh, let alone uh, not only the imaging, but uh, the technical challenges of, uh, of, of uh, using these novel therapies means that it's going to have to be really restricted for a while before it's worked out. And I don't think uh, we'll be ready for 584 tricuspid interventional sites anytime soon. So those are my, my thoughts. I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said predicting results. Yeah. Because there's so little experience. You know, I mean, if you look at the number of surgeons who have experience with isolated TR surgery, I mean, it's, it's very, very little. And then even as clinicians, we're just learning how to see the, evaluate these patients with isolated TR. Yeah. You know, and, and the symptoms are, as you describe, difficult to pin down as being related to the TR. And there, there are just so many questions. And I think we have a lot to learn about how to predict these results. Yeah, I think the, the one last question, I guess, for the panel is, um, John, you talked about consistency of result, and we didn't get to present uh, the transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement device that's out there that basically takes away all of tricuspid regurgitation. Is that the most important thing in these patients? Um, the, that device has now had 27 implants, but does have, you know, does have an 8% mortality. Um, eight. In the 27 patients. Are you talking about Navigate? Which yeah, yeah, Navigate. Yeah. Um, and although we've reached the surgical bar, and it should, and that's a first-generation device, so we should go down from there. Um, is is that the goal? Is is replacement the answer for everything, or is there actually, um, you know, a role for all these other devices? Well, we've always hesitated to think about tricuspid valve replacement. Uh, Certainly the experience with mechanical valves is terrible in terms of thrombosis, but uh, with bioprosthetic valves, perhaps that's less of an issue. Uh, although, you know, we've seen valve leaflet thickenings creep into the aortic area. It's now in the TMVR area. It's certainly there, and you would think it's even going to be a bigger issue in the tricuspid area. So you're going to have to anticoagulate these, these people when to replace them. But, I don't know, Becky. Uh, I think some of these people are, are clearly um, suffering so much uh, that an 8% or whatever mortality may be, quote, acceptable if you can demonstrate that the um, nine, whatever, over 90% of people who don't die have true clinical uh, benefit. Um, that, that would be... Um, I think a, a reasonable balance of, of benefits versus risk for an extreme population. Excellent. I, I love this session. Anyway, thanks everyone for sticking around. <laughs>